Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shamika Sharma, and I will be your moderator today. Thank you for taking time to join us in this webinar, Redefining Playscapes for All. The session today is brought to you by Y2 and is supported by Design Singapore Council, the National Agency for Design in Singapore, and the National Design Center. The webinar is part of the National Design Center's program lineup with a thematic focus on power play. Y2 is honored to be invited to contribute to this discourse, exploring how the concept of play and design helps to elevate user experience and differentiate the business from another. Information on other programs in this month's lineup will be shared with you at the end of the session. Allow me to quickly introduce myself. I'm a UK registered architect and principal of my eponymous multidisciplinary design studio in Singapore, built on over 15 years experience in architecture on four continents. In recent years, I've had the opportunity to exhibit interactive concrete sculptures for rest and play in the context of my favorite playscape, the beach, at Sculpture by the Sea in Australia. When I was first invited to moderate a talk about playscapes, I immediately thought of architect Aldo Van Eyck's playgrounds as well as, of course, his orphanage in the Netherlands. Van Eyck really considered play through composition with an emphasis on pure geometry, while the target audience, while the target audience of Van Eyck's playgrounds was indeed children, playscapes defined themselves separately from playgrounds because of their multi-generational appeal. The four playscapes that will be presented today are immediately striking for the way play is expressed through color, geometry, composition, and the use of texture. Of course, play needs to be experienced. The fourth dimension is essential. I hope that many of you have the opportunity to visit some of these playscapes. Before we proceed with the presentations, I would like to highlight a few housekeeping notes. Should you encounter any technical issues, please reach out to our technical team through the chat, Zoom chat function. We ask for your patience and understanding should conditions be less than perfect. During this webinar, your audio will be on mute mode. However, we welcome questions throughout the session. Please keep your questions coming in through the Zoom Q&A function. When posting a question, please identify yourself and indicate if you'd like a specific panelist to address your question. With that out of the way, please allow me to introduce the speakers for this evening. Jan Follin, Managing Director of Y2, who will be speaking on dreamscapes between play and art. Jan Follin is the co-founder of Y2, Singapore and Paris, with the, rich, with the fundamental belief that design must serve a cause. He has built a rich multicultural experience from his formative years in Indonesia, France, and Singapore. Embracing multidisciplinary approaches to grow the Singapore practice, Jan has established diverse expertise in sustainable architecture, cultural curation, and exhibition design. In his talk titled, Dreamscapes between play and art, Jan will be sharing how dreams can take you to wondrous places. They motivate you to find and express yourself and give you the courage to become greater. Committed to inspire young and curious minds through art, multidimensional, playful, and interactive artworks aim to spark curiosity for the young ones about the world around them. Encourage openness to discover diversity and imagine new possibilities, a journey that weaves play and art. Next up, we'll have architect Lo Zhu Ping, senior architect at RSP, who will be speaking on a retail play space. Lo Zhu Ping is a senior architect at RSP. His first experience with the joys of space making and world crafting come from his love of video games, steeped in folklore and magic, as well as comic books. He believes that architecture and design are exercises in empathy. He was one of the lead architects involved in the latest redevelopment of Funan, Singapore. When not attending to matters of the built environment, Zhu Ping can be found exploring dungeons and killing dragons in the world of Warcraft. In his talk titled, A Retail Play Space, 
He will share more about the recently completed Funan as a retail space designed to cater to a new generation of consumers looking for a different engagement experience. We will take a look at how basic concepts of play and make-believe can shape this reimagined retail experience. Following that, we'll have Leonard Ng, Studio Director of Singapore and Beijing at Rumble Studio Dry Zaitel, who will be speaking on The Squirrel in You. Leonard joined Rumble Studio Dry Zaitel in 2008, where he's the Studio Director of Singapore and Beijing. His academic background and design interests lay at the juncture between humans and their environment with the aim of finding a long-term sustainable balance between them. His approach involves extensive collaboration with diverse professions to foment holistic landscape-based solutions that engage and educate users while respecting the environment. In his talk titled, The Squirrel in You, Leonard will share the importance of contextualizing adventure play and how nature can inspire playground design, an example through the lens of the largest public adventure playground in, Zing in Singapore in Jurong Lakeside Gardens. And finally, we will have Daliana Suryaminata and Florian Heinzelmann, founders of Shao Architects from Indonesia. They will be speaking on 5P public-private partnership play places. Shao is an award-winning architectural and urban design practice founded by the architect couple Daliana Suryaminata, Florian Heinzelmann, and Tobias Hoffman in the Netherlands, Germany, and then later in Indonesia. Shao is best known for their microlibraries, which merge community and environmental design aspects with material experimentation into novel multifunctional typologies. They further realized several pu public space projects, but also residential projects for public as well as private clients. Shao's multinational background and international experience in design practices enables them to come up with their unique design approach. In their talk titled 5P Private-Public Partnership Play Place, Daliana and Florian will share their recent works on public spaces. Realizing that homo ludens is in every one of us, young and old, rich or poor, inserting ludic spaces here and there should be on an architect's agenda. What play spaces are possible when facing budget restrictions and many other challenges? There are many factors, stakeholders, commitment, funding availability, climatic consideration, community engagement, user readiness, and perhaps political will. And the Indonesian context brings possibilities as well as complexity into the design process, execution, and usage. I will now hand you over to our first speaker, Jan. Hi everyone, so thank, thank you very much Amika, for this great uh, introduction and uh, thank you everyone for being here, so it's a pleasure to, to be here with you and to share all of these ideas on, on the redefining playscape. So we'll be sharing my screen, so here it is. All right, so I hope you can all see my, my screen, so dreamscapes uh, between play and art. Um, so I'm Jan, again from Wito, and so we'll be sharing that today. So like, first of all, let's just remind ourselves like, how did this um, idea of, uh, of museum come about? So it is as ancient as like, ancient Greek, ancient Greece, like this, where basically the museum was a temple dedicated to the muses, uh, inspiring for art, science, and literature. Fast forward, modern, modern days, uh, so uh, dedicated to intellect, to thought, and creativity. So when we move, towards the modern days and early beginnings, where we have this first Jardin Royal des Plantes Medicinales, which was the very first modern museum uh, to basically collect all of the like, medicinal plants. And later on, uh, the, the century later, the opening of the, the menagerie, uh, where basically it was to exhibit the flora and the fauna. Uh, but also at that time, cabinets of curiosity, as we can see here on that, on that view, where it was uh, displaying a collection of artifacts, classical and ancient art, um, as you can see again here. So since then, museum development has been prolific all around the world. Uh, some of the most iconic museums, as you, as you know, the Louvre, uh, for example, or, or even the National Gallery in the UK, uh, the Met, 
uh, the Musée d'Orsay, or even our own National Gallery in Singapore. So major, big museum, renowned, renowned internationally. So within this, we have a certain way of displaying art, a very conventional way, the formal museum visual display. Wall mount, ceiling mount, uh, showcase, floor mount, all of these are very conventional, I would say. We are very used, uh, very used to that. Here again, we can see the, the National Gallery, a uh, very classical way. I, I designed it so I know exactly how it is. So very classical, uh, corresponding to international standard. But most of the time, what we have is this design. Don't touch, don't run, don't jump, don't talk loud, don't sing, don't draw on walls, don't have fun. Sometimes a museum are not necessarily associated to dream or to like play escape. Uh, so what can we do about that? Can, can museum uh, be machines to dream at the crossroad between art and play? So that, that's what I would like to share with you today. Can museum be machines to dream at the crossroad between art and play? Of course, yes. If I'm asking you the question, it's because it is yes. Um, and, uh, and again, I will go back to the National Gallery because there is an amazing team there in the National Gallery that is pushing for many things uh, to, to reconfigure museums. So to achieve this uh, together, we, we, we shall focus on the body in space and, and how it perceives and how it interacts uh, with it. Uh, so the body in space, uh, multi-sensorial strategies, the five senses, uh, combined with uh, physical ergonomics, like for the, the sound, the light, the temperature, and even this uh, cognitive ergonomics. How do we, um, how do we react uh, to it? How our, basically our brain is, is uh, welcoming all of these like, things that are surrounding us, that are exciting us. So um, there is like, two projects that I would like to share with you that are very close to my heart. Uh, because it is something that we developed again with the fantastic team at the National Gallery for the Children's Festival, Small Big Dreamers. And together we've been pushing the boundary of, of the museum to develop something different uh, for new experiences. Um, the, the, the first one that we did two years ago was around the, the, the work of Li Wen. Uh, Li Wen who has now passed away, he's a very important figure, uh, an art figure in Singapore. Um, very well known for his color, the movement, the journey, the passageway, uh, uh, the yellow man, basically. So I had the great chance of working with him and with my team and also with the team of the National Gallery to develop an entire um, experience for, for the kids. So talking to him, we understood that basically his work, the characteristic of his work is this combination between uh, reality and dream. So together, what is basically, what can we offer uh, to the audience? So with this, we got inspired because he was a performing artist. We got, we got inspired. We looked at the work of Kandinsky, for example, or Rudolf Slaban to, to see the, the movement of the body, the lines, and how we can deconstruct that. And our design aims was to capture this harmonious contrast between dreams and reality. Uh, representing as well the themes of his work of color, journey, and movement. So with this, we started to look at body movement, body posture, and how we can invite the kids and the visitors to perhaps recreate those body movements. Um, the form, the dreamer, all of us, uh, and the yellow man, of course, Lee went to so the dreamer and yellow man, uh, the form and the shape, so what we create when we move, so we create shapes with our, with our body. And so all together the dreamer and the dream uh, that are happening in the space. So with this, we develop uh, some activities uh, with the National Gallery team uh, and to have always this uh, combination between small and big. Uh, when we are small, when you are a kid, how do we perceive big things and vice versa? Uh, so that was the, the start of the journey. And then we develop all of those little characters to, to help the kids by seeing them say, well, I can do the same. And so to, to take part and to start to express yourself. Um, the expression of your body is one of the first form of art. Um, so we did this anatomy of dreamer from Lee Wen. Uh, then we started to incorporate all of these uh, uh, personas inside the space. 
And here, I even witnessed once I was there and you have, they were having this little girl, she was doing exactly the same. So it was exactly what we wanted to do, uh, to invite the kids, to go in it, to run, to, 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 to jump, and to go in between all of those like, cords like that, and, and indeed to start like jumping and running and climbing, uh, because it is like a sort of like a form of art uh, by, by expressing your body in the space. Um, and then with this, like we continued to invite uh, the young ones to discover, to touch, to feel, uh, to see the wind happening inside. Um, and since we wanted to excite the five senses, we even asked them to create sounds. Well, uh, not everyone <laughs> enjoyed that because it was super, super loud, but it was a kind of like very fun orchestra done by the kids uh, to basically like hit some like, like uh, daily life kind of things. And even to hide like this little girl. Like she exactly understood what to do, just like jump inside it and, and just hide yourself, you know? Um, so again, this idea of small and, small and big, what is small for us was gigantic for her. So, so very, very uh, exciting to see that and to run and to run again and again and again. Uh, kids never stop. So um, it was to, to really develop all of that uh, for them. And not to forget to dream. Uh, at, some at some point, you need to pose, to sit down, so another body posture, to enter in, the, in this kind of environment where uh, you can write your dreams and your fear, and you can just like, place them on those um, like, like wings of angel of, of, of a bird that you can put on that uh, kind of cage. Um, so, so it was the moment of dream as well. So um, following the, the success of these small big dreamers, we. Um, we had the great opportunity to continue the journey with the National Gallery um, and, and to develop those experiences that are immersive and memorable for meaningful learning outcomes. And, and I always remember the, the team there always telling us, what is the learning outcome? What, what, are, what are kids will be doing there um, to always make them growing? So, so that's, uh, that's where we develop those immersive and memorable experiences. Um, embracing Wonders, it was last year, the Children's Biennale, uh, again at the National Gallery. So for that, the setting was a bit different, where we were working with, a, with like different artists. And so the artists, they were having their artwork, such as Econo Guoho, amazing artist from Indonesia, Memories of Firefly. So he's well known for this lantern and for all of his artworks. And so we could collaborate with him to give even more life to them. Uh, to, to have more interaction. I, I know that nowadays it's a bit more difficult uh, with COVID-19, uh, but how can we trigger emotions, um, notion of like diversity, togetherness, respect, caring for each other, love. So those interactive moments where kids could like jumping, going somewhere like around the lantern, going inside together. Uh, and by doing that, it was triggering some light, triggering some sound. So from the artwork of Echo, we could do something even more interactive. And we even did that gigantic lantern that was now moving so the kids could go in and start to swim the thing. It was making this very big like sound, but it was like, like elect electrifying. Like, wow, like the kids were so excited to go, to go inside. Um, also, we, we worked with uh, two other artists, um, uh, like Eric Wong and Lauren uh, Tan, who, who did this Karan uh, So it's from uh, a small little like, comic, I would say. Um, and so with them, we could develop an entire like, playscape. Um, and, um, and that's what we started to do here, to sketch, to define some zones of like, different activities and to discover at any point of time, different world, because again, like, let's go down at the height of the kids, that kind of room might sound gigantic for them. So, um, so in here, we were exhibiting some of possible kind of mini model for the kids to do also on their own. So it was to trigger creativity as well. Uh, or to say, like, larger than life kind of robot. So trust me, this one, like, people were just like, running on it, wanting to climb on it to take picture and so on. So we had to put like, more boxes all around to make sure that the kids are not jumping on it. But, uh, but it is, of course, inviting and exciting. Uh, and at the same time, some moment of break, of pause, um, some moment of respite, 
So that's why we designed this, this molecular like sofa like that. And even to look into the imagination of floating structure that we recreated inside the space for kids also to dream even more. Um, and so the, this last artwork that I would like to share with you is from Miriam Anko from, from Myanmar. Um, and so like just this kind of sketch and well, we are also architects, so we could design this like a uh, compound house and to understand all of the structure, uh, how to build it and to insert it into an amazing space, uh, the, the historical lobby of the former Supreme Court. So can you imagine to place there um, a compound house right inside the National Gallery, right inside the former Supreme Court, uh, to invite kids to go inside, to do um, all of their drawings as well, and scratching things and, and so on, uh, together in the same space. So to have like, more, more excitement. Um, and here, uh, not, to, not to forget that um, uh, the young ones, some have disabilities, so to welcome everyone, to make sure that all kids can go, can go inside and can experience uh, all, sort of, all sort of experiences, no matter uh, how they are or where they are coming from. So it is something very um, welcoming. And, and again, I'm, I'm thankful to the National Gallery to, to develop that and to create a different kind of museum. So in, in conclusion, um, I would like to, to, to really look forward. Uh, what is the future of, uh, of museum? Uh, the, the future of museum is definitely to create dreamscapes for all, more than playscape. A playscape, we know how to do it but dreamscapes is really the next level. Uh, and when we say for all, here I shared with you examples for kids, but actually it was quite funny to see how the parents were, were also reacting uh, to that and, and even working with the artist uh, to see how uh, we can develop those installations uh, to welcome everyone. So um, I hope that um, you enjoyed this, uh, this talk and, um, and I look forward for more Q&A uh, at the end of the session. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, let's talk later on this dreamscape forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, for your fascinating talk about dreamscapes. And I would now like to hand you over to Zhu Ping. Um, Zhu Ping will be talking about play in retail, a retail play space. And I will hand you over to him now. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, wait, I think my camera is not working. Hi. <laughs> Hello from the RSP office. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Nope. Okay, let me just fix this. Give me a moment. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, oh no, that spoiled the moment for everybody. Right. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Drew Ping. I'm from RSP. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about the retail play space, specifically in relation to the work that we did uh, with Funan, the redevelopment. So before we go to Funan, uh, let me bring you to Azeroth. Azeroth is the world in which the World of Warcraft is created. Um, and the World of Warcraft really is an online game with millions of players. Um, it is personally for me the best MMORPG there is there. The Final Fantasy boys, of course, will disagree. But it really is the 2020 iteration of play and what the space concepts are. So if we look at uh, the history of the World of Warcraft, actually it's based on kind of the fundamentals of role-playing games, which is uh, dungeon, set out in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and we will go through some base concepts of play in this and see how this was applied to the Funan Mall. And perhaps we can project into the future with some ideas that we have uh, incubating in Singapore and all around the world for perhaps a future of retail and experiential um, design. So just a brief introduction on Funan. Funan is what, uh, a space that we call the live, work, and play, and everywhere in between. It has a very prosperous uh, GFA of 888,000 8, square feet, and NLA of 325 square, square feet. So NLA is net leasable area. Uh, part of the strata is grade A offices, as well as a hotel uh, with 279 apartments facing the Hill Street side. The team was huge. Uh, RSP was the lead consultant uh, with the developer of Capital Land and the rest of the design consultants are uh, as shown on screen. Uh, we also had uh, a contractor, which is a homegrown firm, uh, Wohub, uh, pairing up with Obayashi for a joint venture. So this just set some context uh, for the development. Uh, Funan sits in the civic district, so it is near icons such as uh, the Supreme Court and Treasury, so 
construction was challenging. Um, and it's also flanked by Hill Street and North Bridge Road, which are two main uh, thoroughfares leading to the development. Um, the massing is as shown. So what we're going to be focusing on is the red portion, which is the retail podium. And that is where a lot of the play concepts come in. Um, there are also uh, brilliant designs done by farm for the hotel uh, component, which is the blue area, as well as office components where tenants have taken up large amounts of space for their own twist on playing and working in the civic district. So let's talk about just the retail portion. This is a sectional rendering. Um, I, it was very hard to find a photo that fully expresses this on the actual built uh, space, so I'll be showing this. Some of the key callouts you can see here are the level one, uh, main thoroughfare, then we can see where my mouse is pointing. This is where most of the streetscape is absorbed. I'll show you through plan later. Um, level four, which is where the streets, the, the pedestrians are dispersed into different programs that are level on level four. And of course, the, the famous tree of life, which forms the central uh, vertical peculator, I guess you could call it, uh, that is the spine throughout the entire development. Uh, the tree of life is a multi-level structure that houses a whole bunch of activities. And the intent for this is that it will be a rotating tenant mix. Um, and we have designed it so that there's seamless transitions from levels to half levels. So it's kind of like a level mezzanine, level mezzanine kind of arrangement. So um, play is a framework for retail design. Uh, retail experience or actually any experience on matter borrows from play and make believe. And we, we kind of have funneled it down to three main ideas just for the sake of this presentation. First is kind of the adventure of a space. The, the next idea is the, the perception of others. And the next one is a, a realization of self. So um, adventure, huzzah. If, you, if all these images are very foreign to you, it is because they are to most people. Um, the, these are components of the World of Warcraft. On the left, you see here, this is a map of a dungeon. Uh, it is not as horrible as it seems. You just go in and kill monsters. All right. In the middle here is a place called Mechagon, which is a place for the Mecha Gnomes, which are a race in the World of Warcraft. This, this is very nerdy, just, just, just bear with me here. Uh, Innkeeper is a place where you rest. And this uh, spider woman is called Yasma. She is the end boss for one of the dungeons. She is very difficult to kill, uh, but very fun to defeat. But what we see in the curation of any game is that, uh, or any play situation for that matter, is that they're very common elements. Uh, an opportunity for exploration. I think Jan has shown that in his um, uh, museum talk. Uh, space for events, spaces for rest or rhythm changes, and tangible uh, kind of kinesthetic appeals to the material and aesthetic changes. So let's talk about adventure. Uh, in FUNA, we tried to implement this through three main devices. It's, this is not exhaustive, but kind of the three main large ideas. So the first one is variations and movements. Uh, the next one is the creation of a dynamic streetscape. And the last one, of course, is the use of materiality and texture. So uh, variations and movements. As I mentioned before, level one and level four have been considered our kind of two thoroughfares. And this was all tied together by a vertical spine. Uh, we always found interest in the circulation to and from uh, the, the, uh, the first and fourth levels via the tree of life, or you could also access this through you know, the escalator networks and the lifts. But we did want this counterpoint between the verticality of this tree of life and the surrounding horizontal movement that you would have through the atrium. We also, this, uh, you know, the design team and the project team also saw this as you know, an interesting play where it is no longer a situation where a mall has a giant atrium running through, but you could almost kind of suspend yourself through the central atrium and move around. Um, and that to us was very important as a creation of an adventurous space for retail. The second idea is um, how we transition from outdoor to indoor. So as part of you know, enlivening the civic district and creating almost like a mini oasis in the area, there are green pockets that are key parts of this development. Uh, the first one, of course, being the communal roof garden. I'll show you some photos later. There's an urban rooftop farm, a futsal court, a garden staircase, and all these can kind of be, ex be, be accessed from uh, common circulations leading to the mall, either at the Coleman Junction or the entrances at Hill Street and Northbridge Road. These are all semi-open space, semi-open social spaces, semi-shaded, with the objective of forming an oasis in the city. And what's important also is they offer vistas to the surrounding urban scape. So as part of your journey through the Funan development, we, we have made an effort to weave uh, indoor and outdoor, a weaving of commercial spaces into uh, you know, circulation, as well as you know, we, we quite like the idea of people crawling on the facade. So that's why the garden stairs is there, right smack on the, the external green wall for people to walk up. It is a 
bit of a precarious experience if you have vertigo, but actually it is uh, one of the best views of the city. Um, and what was important to this is that we brought people outside the mall. I know it's a bit of a counterpoint, a bit of a well, irony in Singapore where it's, it's hot and people like to stay indoors. But you know, the change of temperature, uh, a bit of uh, change of the sights and smells. Uh, in the urban garden, actually there's an herb garden, so it's actually quite fragrant at certain points of the day. So we wanted this variation as opposed to the typical homogenous offering that you know, a, a, mall might, a mall might give you at any, part, at any other place in the world. Um, the next kind of idea that we wanted to bring in was a dynamic streetscape. Uh, if you went to Funan, the development, you realized that surrounding the area, we've pulled the paver development design into level one. So as you move into level one, you know, we're kind of trying to create that seamless experience of moving from the surrounding pedestrianized area into the retail space. Uh, and this is coupled with an, a sitting living room that was designed at the entrance of Coleman. So the client actually made a sacrifice in leasable area in order to create this social space. High volume, uh, and as I mentioned, and I'll show you later, we also kind of tried to, you know, uh, maybe push the boundary of design a little bit, especially with regards to user interfacing. Um, this is our, uh, well, the cycling into Funa Mall really was tapping into the walking cycling plan that was planned into the civic district. Uh, we were kind of looking at this idea of perhaps changing the, ve the, the velocity of which people experience a mall. Uh, and this uh, was a solution. So not only is there a path running through the development that's pulled directly from the walking cycling plan, but we also have a bike hub uh, located at the south of the development. So the idea, as you can see in the center photo, is that you could come in uh, to work, especially if you worked in the upper floors, park your bike, park your bike, service it a little bit, shower, and then go to work, and then you know, bring your bike out after a day's work. Um, so this really is, is an interesting uh, dynamic that we're looking at because, you know, not, malls are primarily um, explored through, on foot. So we thought, you know, perhaps this could be an exciting way of bringing people into the mall, even at the non-mall hours. The next idea uh, that we brought into Funan really is a variation of materiality and texture. Uh, I think if anybody ran through Funan, you would see like the, the, the common way of describing it is green, grey, wood and metal. That, that's, that's really it. Uh, we adopted an industrial chic uh, color palette. And there's, of course, a variation between soft and warm, hard and cold. Uh, so some of the key uh, design callouts you can see here are, of course, the, the facade, which has a dichroic paint and is deliberately been faceted so that as you walk past, you know, under the, the, the Singapore sunlight, you would see a variation in color. Um, and we kind of wanted to also veer away a bit more from the traditional polished, I guess you could say, aesthetic that most Singaporean buildings have. So we did kind of embrace the grittiness a little bit, almost like a manufactured patina. So in the urban gardens, especially on level seven and level four, we do have the use of fair face concrete that is meant to weather and create a little bit of character uh, when, you know, after some use with the plants growing on it. And we did want to create this bit of wilderness um, in, in the development. And that to us was an important thing. So, the, you know, these variations between uh, the hard and soft, uh, the places that are air conditioned and non-air conditioned was an important part of creating the sense of adventure for Funan. So that's the, that's the first point. Uh, just see, these are some more examples of our use of material, using of dark steel for the tree of life as a counterpoint to the lighter steel of the atrium so that the tree of life becomes more of a contrasting object. So the next one is, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard this phrase, LFG. It's a common phrase used uh, in MMORPGs or massive multiplayer online RPGs. Uh, essentially, it builds on this culture that play has to be social. Uh, there are many events curated in these games for people to come together. It is always integrated with the environment. And what's important is vistas to other activities. So if you look to the left here, this is a city called Ogrima. Uh, it is the Horde-based city. Okay, essentially, it's where everybody comes together to do administration. Okay, so if you were to wander around Ogrima, you would see people banking or leatherworking or trading or auctioning. Uh, over here is a raid called Rathion, where players can band together to kill a giant dragon because, you know, you must always kill a dragon in role-playing games. Um, essentially, the, the whole point of this is that communal activity in play is very important. And um, which brings us to our next point, the sense of others. Um, in Funa, we try to curate this through a series of nodes and rest points. And also something that I think ma many architects struggle with, which is vistas and cross paths. And I hope we, we, we've executed this pretty, pretty satisfactorily. Um, in designing of this uh, development, the use of lepak was a common phrase uh, between the younger architects. Uh, essentially, the, 
what we wanted to do was create, it, create spaces for you to just do nothing. Um, these are surgical insertions into the circulation of the development. And we integrated these spaces so that there's opportunity for events as well. Um, and just to note that uh, in the, the, the development of Funan, our clients, uh, Capital Land, were right there with us in this madness. So uh, there was a deliberate sacrifice of less leasable area uh, in the creation of these uh, lay park spaces. So just a few call outs are uh, level seven. There's a whole bunch of greenery with hammocks and all that for you to sit down and relax. A lot of photo moments, so the influencers really enjoy that. Uh, we do have a pool uh, facing Hill Street. Um, there's, of course, the Grand Staircase, which I think many people have, have experienced themselves. On the right side uh, are some oh, key rest areas as well. Um, you have what we call uh, the husband's stairs uh, that we've integrated into the Tree of Life, which is essentially our bleachers for people to sit, as well as overlook points. So you kind of get a whole view of the mall through sitting on these spaces. Um, and of course, to appeal to the Singaporean user, you know, because our Maslow's hierarchy of needs has changed, there are places for you to charge your digital devices as well as access the Wi-Fi. So these are things that we thought would be important. It is no, no longer just going to a place to shop. In fact, finding a place to sit down, maybe experience a new product you bought, you know, enjoy unboxing it, would be important in a retail experience. Um, so these examples of people just using the space. Uh, more, this is the, the, the roof garden as well as uh, this is one of the coveted spots, of course, uh, during National Day and the New Year's Eve parade. It is the prime watching spot for your fireworks. The next idea is seeing others. And this is done to a curation of vistas and cross paths. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have explored uh, Singapore during the circuit breaker and been into the malls, if you can. It is rather creepy to see, you know, large architecture with very few people around. So in the retail space, we did try to create an, a sense of organic forms where people could see each other. The hustle and bustle of the mall needs to be captured in the retail design. And, and that was something that we tried to do. So if you went to the development, Funan, you would find that there are many organic forms or, or geometric forms that cross and overlap, both on the vertical and horizontal plane. And these add to you know, the, the, the energy of a retail experience. So just this photo kind of sums it up pretty much you know, as you climb uh, the wall in your uh, Lululemon, right? People will be able to see you climbing up the same way you would be able to look down and decide on where you want to eat after your climbing session. So these kind you know, of, of vistas into other activities is important as part of the social experience of any retail development. That's what we try to imbue in the, in the, in the project. So next really is a sense of self. Um, the first few terms might be very foreign to you, but the monk is a class in the world of Warcraft. A panda is a race that I play because they're, they're adorable. Uh, alchemists and herbalists are professions and the horde is a faction that I'm part of. Uh, the sense of self in play is very important. In every playscape, there's always an avatar or in, in the world of Warcraft, we call this a toon. Even when you play make-believe with your friends, you kind, of, you kind of either inhibit the world, the villain or the hero, right? These are, these are very basic childhood ideas. Um, customization and identity is important and also to create a diversity in texture and experience. So the different races look very, very different, carry the armor differently. And also this idea of tribes, my people and your people. Uh, some people have really so entrenched themselves in the world of Warcraft that they've tattooed, you know, the hot insignia on their body. Uh, that's, that's the next level of stuff, man. So essentially, these ideas are important, the, the realization of self. And in Funa, we've created these passion clusters, um, six kind of, ideas or six people to be catered to. Uh, the, the, the people who are into fitness, a bit of uh, fashion, the, the gamers, uh, the techies, the cross people, and the ones who love to eat, which are pretty much every Singaporean. Um, and the idea with this is that we, there are spaces that are designed for uh, purposely to, create, to, to cater to these people. They are integrated in the tree of life, but one of the key um, spaces actually is level four, as I've mentioned before where you have the garden stairs that of course brings you to the roof, but we also have deliberate design for purpose spaces. So you have the entrance to Golden Village Cinema. Uh, you have also the entrance to Wild Rice Theatre. So the Wild Rice Theatre was designed by Zark and Charcoal Blue and is the first thrust stage borrowing from ancient Shakespearean, like the Globe Theatre uh, formats um, in Singapore. You also have the service residence, Life uh, by Ascot, which is designed by Farm. So this was a coll collaborative experience, for, especially for these specialized spaces for these different interest groups. So um, now that I've kind of shared a, a little bit about Funan, you can see that these are the base concepts of play, right? It, there's a, always an initial spark, which uh, are the three ideas of adventure, others, and self. 
World of Warcraft or any other video game for that matter has developed on this, right? By using technology and adjusting to suit new users' tastes and expectations. And of course, lowering barriers to entry. So I play with a whole group bunch of people from the Philippines, the, uh, the US, Australia, and it's been a joy because these international communities add layers to, to, the, to the game. And now that as we kind of move into the future, uh, so with you know, COVID and, and the, what the future of the built environment is going to be like, we can just look at maybe two ideas. Uh, one is this idea of communal yet bespoke. And the next idea is augmentation. So communal yet bespoke, hashtag tribe, hashtag architecture. Um, the hashtag is kind of the symbol of the, anybody who's lived in the 2020s. Yeah, I think we all agree with all that. Um, and uh, just as a segue, when, we, when Funan was about to be launched, a uh, show suite was designed uh, by Lekker, Lekker Architects. And this was kind of a distillation of the, some of the key concepts of Funan. Um, and this idea was to have windows out and in into the development just so people could get a peek of the Funan of the future. It was meant for tenants, but also one of the key things was the production, was the curation of workshops, uh, which came in the form of many, many interesting things. Calligraphy, leatherworking, uh, personalization of ideas. And this kind of all fits within the hashtag narrative because the hashtag, right, kind of establishes a form of community. It is borrowed from old coding language. It establishes a form of community while at the same time allowing for individual expression and input. So if you searched uh, Funan SG hashtag, you would find uh, 120, uh, 20, 12,000 posts, sorry, on it. And essentially there are photos that people have taken of the mall from different angles, uh, a, a bit of self-expression by contributing to the overall body of Funan photos. So our question really then is, can this be pushed further? Um, can, can it not just be uh, limited to photos or videos, but the architecture and space itself? Uh, borrowing from some of our contemporaries work, uh, the Archifest Pavilion uh, 2018 by Kite Studio Architecture was, was a really interesting study in this. Um, users could touch and play with the buildings as if it was a toy. Uh, you know, so sorry, you can... sorry to interrupt you, yep. Bing. You, you've, uh, you've got about two minutes to go. Okay, almost there. Okay, thank yeah. you. So uh, users could touch the building and paint with little swatches that they have uh, just to, so the building was itself a play space. Uh, we tried to do this with Hunan. Uh, where users could, through motion sensors, do, you know, edit the, the facade a little bit. Uh, and this was kind of a little bit of play on uh, this idea of the building as a toy. The next uh, last point really is augmentation. So since for, for any young person, you would know that augmentation of a play space is important. And that's why Pokemon Go was so successful, right? When the Pokemon world was layered onto the modern world, it became uh, a new world altogether. Uh, and perhaps this is the future of how architecture is going to move, where not only would you augment existing spaces, but you will also design spaces to be virtually augmented. Uh, we saw this as a very exciting idea in SUTD's virtual studio, where students designed two spaces, the physical environment and the virtual environment. And perhaps in the future of retail experiential design, you would see this, you know, moving forward. So, uh, well, this is the end of my talk. Sorry for overshooting a little bit. Uh, I hope the points were interesting. Uh, thank you and go have an adventure. Thank you very much, Xu Ping, and that was, that was very interesting. We've got a number of questions coming in. Please continue to send in your questions as we go along. Um, we will now be going over to Leonard of RSP, and he will be, sorry, of RSD, um, of Rumble Studio Drysettle, and he will be talking about the squirrel in you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank Yen and uh, Design Singapore for inviting me. I will now share my video. Please let me know when you see it. Is it visible? We see it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, play in a park. Uh, I've titled my uh, talk today, The Squirrel in You, uh, because, you know, uh, every, in everybody, there's, there's a really a kid in you. And uh, for all of us, we are always looking for spaces where we can relax, let our head, uh, uh, hair down, right, uh, and, and have some fun. Um, but, you know, this is the state of play, right? Uh, our cities are being densified. 
right? Uh, the, there are very little spaces for nature. Uh, most of the so-called playing spaces are programmed, right, and predictable. So, uh, you know, we need to envision how we can uh, make our green spaces more useful as spaces for people to play, to relax, right, uh, and, and to uh, relate and build communal uh, relationship. So when we were first invited for this uh, competition, uh, which was for Joe Lake Garden West, right, uh, researching the background of this area, we found that it was actually a swamp previously. So we felt that there was an opportunity, right, to link our proposal to the uh, uh, natural heritage, right, and provide us with a canvas to showcase some of the uh, natural wonders, as well as uh, 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 spaces for uh, humans and uh, the community to relate to nature. So one of the first things was so we looked at the swamp, you know, and, and that was uh, what was previously there. The problem is the swamp is a pretty intimidating environment, right? You've got all these dense trees with dense undergrowth and, and spiky trunks and, and, and partially flooded uh, ground. So we thought that the, the first thing we should do is maybe defragment this, uh, the, the, the elements, the basic elements of this uh, uh, swamp area, right? And present it in a, in a more legible, legible manner, showcasing the specific uh, elements, right? That, is, uh, that highlights to you what the, the, the special character of a swamp means. And then also at the same time, creating a uh, habitat, right? That will uh, encourage biodiversity, Right, to come and propagate the site right, and, and provide their points of interest. Uh, this, uh, and you see that there will be a lot of images in this presentation that's been taken from Instagram. Right? Uh, and this was a, a post by uh, some of the users to a, a shortly after it opened, right? uh, where uh, you, know, you commonly see hornbills there. Right? But we're not just providing spaces for hornbills and uh, attracting uh, uh, bird life. We're actually creating environments, right? Environments where you can get immersed in right? this grassland, right? You feel that you are in nature, even though you are within a dense So this was the grassland that we created and we attract this flock of birds and uh, it, it, it provides a view for you to see, but at the same time, it's a palette for you to imagine play areas. So uh, one of the brief was to create an, a playground, adventure playground within this large park, right? And we were allo uh, allotted a space of two hectares. Uh, it uh, happens to be one of the largest uh, uh, adventure playground in Singapore. And we thought that it makes sense for us, right, to contextualize display elements, right, by, by relating to what was there previously, right, and also make it uh, educational in its approach. So we're looking to move and explore an animal, right, to nest and build an animal and to uh, immerse and act by the animal. So these were some of the uh, considerations we uh, came up with when we were exploring this design. Uh, there was the natural habitats, there was the e ecosystems, and there was the educational aspects, right? And we wanted to link it to the movements associated with these different animals, like fly like the grey heron, right? Uh, dig like the otter, right? Uh, slither like the uh, snake, right? and jump like the squirrel. And we created the habitat, right? That, uh, that is, uh, and, and the forest, the streams around it to showcase its affinity and its clo uh, close relationship with nature. So the gray heron, which is actually one of the key species on site, is found on the, uh, one of the islands, right? And, and you see that this is one of the photos taken on site on the nest. And we, uh, when we created the nest-like uh, 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 design, we were inspired by the, uh, the shape of the heron nest. Right? Uh, the, the aerial nature, the, the, the uh, heron in flight, right? flying from tree to tree, perching on trees, was something we wanted to reflect in our play, our play elements. And, and, it's reflect, and it's shown in these few conceptual uh, sketches, right? We wanted to create the, the heron nest as an anchor and then allow people to move uh, from the nest using, uh, for example, these sliding cable ways, right? Down towards the nest and they can then climb up the nest and, and, and across aerial walkways. 
So this mimics the flight of the herons, right? And uh, similarly for this slither that the snake, the red tail racer is a, is a common snake that's uh, found around the area, right? We wanted to create an element that's uh, not just uh, totally off the shelf, right? Uh, 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 not, not from on the shelf, but uh, something that's off the shelf, custom made, right? So we create this element that mimics the tree structure, right? Uh, but also included slides. And this tree structure would over time be covered by the greens, uh, uh, greens creepers, right? And uh, kids climbing up will mimic the, the experience of a snake climbing up the branches and then sliding down. Similarly, forest, uh, the, uh, one of the other animals that we featured was jumping like a frog. And you know, just embed these little jumping mats, right? So that kids can mimic the same movement and learn from the experience. Uh, the next, the last one I want to display was the squirrel, right? Uh, this was interesting, you know, we were, we were thinking about how to make it uh, interesting, but at the same time challenging and engaging. So it's this whole series of elements that have been in physical activity, but at the same time learning about how a, a squirrel will move through the systems. So all this uh, highlights the uh, uh, very highly programmed nature of this uh, uh, children's playground. Uh, next, I'd like to display uh, this, uh, the water. Uh, so this is situated next to the Jurong Lake uh, and we wanted to uh, really relate to the water and connect to the water so that the users appreciate uh, the, the strong water element, right? Uh, we start off with thinking about how we can make this educational, right? Uh, thinking about tidal pools, about saws, about ripple ponds, about currents and channels, right? And how we can, uh, while uh, showcasing this, but make it into a, 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 an area where the kids can interpret it themselves. They can decide how they want to engage with this play feature. They, we didn't want it to be highly intensive, highly programmatic, uh, programmatic right? And, and, and how the play was decided for our children. We wanted the children to decide how they want to engage with this play element, right? Uh, but we provided the, uh, the background, right? And all anchored in, in how the characteristics of water in nature, right? Uh, uh, and within the landscape. And so this is a, a typical Saturday We see landscape as, uh, you know, not just uh, a, a park, but the entire park, the entire landscape can be a canvas for play, right? Uh, and we want people to write their own stories when they engage in this uh, canvas. But uh, it is very much dependent on how you structure the spatial arrangement, right? How you create inter interesting topography so people will be inspired to engage with the environment, right? So uh, we were, uh, you see on the right hand side of this plan, we were trying to create uh, a, a, a low, a low uh, floodable area, right, in the tidal area for the grey herons as a, a feeding grounds for the uh, grey herons. Uh, but uh, uh, what happened was that there'll be some soil that will be, uh, you know, will be removed. And we were thinking instead of removing this soil, why not we use it to create uh, nice topographical elements like these oval shapes, right? These oval shapes are actually hill mounds, right? That uh, we use then as a um, uh, orientation element, right? But also an uh, element for you to uh, look around is a vista, right? And also for you to play. So, uh, and then surrounding these uh, uh, hill mounds are a sea of grassland, right? Just spreading out and, and which is an unusual feature in Singapore because you hardly see that. So this, these are the mounds, right? They can be up to uh, three, four meters high and up to 15 meters long. And uh, the kids use it, the kids use it any way they want. Right? 
not only that whole family is sometimes you know partake in this experience playing around you can see them playing around you know for long periods of time just letting their hair down uh, and uh, i talked to you about the uh, uh, sea of grass right you know when creating landscapes uh, we are actually creating an environment that would you know transport your your mind someplace else right allow you to imagine right and and give you the freedom to express right if you look at this picture you 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 would not think that this is in singapore right and 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 we want you to imagine that sometimes you can be in a different place right because by bringing you uh, giving you this mind of, uh, frame of mind you sometimes engage in activities that you will not naturally engage with in other public spaces so this lady you know she speaks different spots and she does her yoga poses right can you imagine her doing this in orchard room it's hard to imagine that right but within this park setting as this canvas it can inspire people to let their hair down and do something like this uh, similarly we see the landscape as a props for the theater of life so this uh, um, um, this is just a collection of logs actually we had to take down some trees that were not healthy or in the wrong position and we decided why not we create an installation that's unlike but it's also an insect hotel right but you know but uh, but we leave it it's almost like a, a prop without actors right and we let the visitor decide that what they want to do with this right it, it is beautiful and you can you can uh, let, let your mind roam free so you know one of these videos posted on Instagram was you know, imagining himself as a dancer, right? Uh, and, and you can tell that she's immersed in the moment, right? Expressing her true self and really enjoying herself. And this is exactly what we want in one of the users. We want them to be able to look at the landscape at much more than a park, right? As uh, as a place where they can uh, go beyond their, their mundane normal life, right? And to act, let, allow their minds to expand. So this is a, a recycled tree. We call this a recycled tree. We built, we built this from uh, recycled materials collected on site. And you know, there are many ways. We wanted to send a signal, right? That, uh, you know, about man's part in, the, in, the, in our ecosystem but uh, allowing visitors to interpret as they may. So in this, in this case, another image from Instagram, right? this lady, right? she, uh, she's making a statement, an environmental statement. She's got this uh, gas mask, right? And obviously she's, uh, and she's got this paint on this face and she's probably indicating that there, you know, uh, a man's damaging influence on the on our environment. And this lady, you know, uh, She's living her dreams, right? Obviously, she's play, uh, role playing, uh, cosplay, right? And she feels that this recycle, uh, this recycled tree made of uh, 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 rebars that we collected on site, right, is an appropriate prop for a uh, uh, role pl uh, role playing that she's engaged in. And then it's really about building memories, uh, memories for the future, right? Uh, happy memories that build a strengthened community relationship. Right uh, and build societies. Uh, and I like to end with this slide because you know this is you know uh, uh, one day one of our staff was there and he took this picture about this uh, father asking the son to leave, right? And uh, and obviously this is really heartwarming for us to see that you know the son do not want to leave, right? Because he is so engaged with the place, he is not his that he wants to keep staying. With that, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Leonard. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. And we are now uh, going to be um, hearing from our last speaker, our very last speakers, or speakers rather, uh, Daliana Suryavinata and Florian Heinzelmann of Shao. They will be talking about 5P Public Private Partnership Play Places, quite a tongue twister. Um, so I will hand you over now to Shao. Thank you. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, and welcome to indeed our tongue twister lecture. So every kid likes to do these tongue twisters. So public private partnership play places. So I exercised it a little bit. So you can also try it for yourself if you manage. 
Um, yes, we're both uh, from uh, Indonesia or we're practicing in Indonesia and we're going to show you uh, four of our projects, our realized projects, which are falling into these uh, play places. So public-private uh, is maybe a little bit different to uh, Singapore because, I mean, we work a lot of with, with the cities and the municipalities, but a lot of our projects are happening via uh, private sponsorship, CSR um, money, especially in the case of the micro-libraries. And Blazes is a sort of a architectural notion which relates itself to Aldo van Eyck and Team 10, um, sort of opposing the modernist rationalist idea of space and time into place and occasion. So it's really like designing for people and you know how to make that happen. Um, this is very important for us. Um, how do we make it? Yeah. Okay. So one of our heroes or one of our inspiration is a uh, constant new house and um, what you see here is his artwork uh, new babylon and uh, he was working on this for 20 years of his life and this is exhibited in in, in the hague and he made several paintings collages videos and and, and models and basically uh, he's advocating a sort of a worldwide city for the future of the the homo ludens the playful person so he elevates the people from the ground um, towards a, 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 a space of self-expression and search and, and play. So in a way, uh, this inspired also a lot of other architects, for instance, MVRDV and, and OMA. Um, but you know, what is important there is, is this verticality aspect, the climbing, the leaving the ground, the different vantage points. Uh, and we saw this already uh, a lot uh, with the previous lectures. That is very important to be able to, you know, not only mentally, but also physically change your perspective and have this upside down view. So this is also uh, very important for, for, for some of our projects. So also the engagement of several senses and of course, uh, learning through playing. And now we will show you the first of our projects and that will be done by Daliana. So hi everyone. So uh, we would like to tell you a story about a project that is very dear to us. That is uh, the project that brought us to Bandung. So uh, Ridwan Kamil in 2014 asked us to design from Rotterdam uh, a place where it is under the Pasupati Highway. And um, it, in the past, this project, uh, this, this location under the Pasupati Bridge, which is a, a highway uh, in the city of Bandung, uh, was said to be haunted. So it's not only empty or deserted or dirty, but also nobody dared to come. Um, so together with a series of other public spaces underneath the bridge, um, Taman Film was envisioned. And it is making use of the topography and as well as the, uh, the, the shading from the, from, the, from the highway. And since uh, it was, we, we, we meant that it could also be used as a public space, as a play space for kids, adults, uh, communities, when it's not streaming movies. So Taman Film means film park, and it is uh, meant to give facility to the, to the movie community there to stream independent movies. So we studied several radiuses um, so that people could gather um, in, 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 in different amount of, um, of groups. And uh, these circles we play um, and, and try to create a certain kind of almost uh, terraces, like, like rice field terraces, so that there are many ways to choose how you would like to sit. Oops. So this is an aerial view. And uh, what, what we like about this project is that it's like wine. It improves throughout time. So uh, there is a, uh, we are using this material of, of this artificial grass carpet. Uh, which then the city extended to cover the whole space, also the whole stairs. And uh, we've seen this being used uh, many times by different uh, communities around the neighborhood because, I mean, Bandung has a lot of uh, urban villages and they do not have uh, public space facilities. So a lot of kids come, a lot of um, um, uh, Ibu Ibu and a lot of communities, a lot of um, gatherings happen. And I've seen, we've seen their babies learning to walk for the first time there. So it is being used as an urban living room. And what surpri surprises us the most is that the community keeps it really clean. And this is something very special for Indonesian public spaces. 
uh, where a sense of ownership, sense of belonging uh, is there and um, garbage collecting and, uh, and taking off shoes before entering this space uh, was done. So this is something very, very special for us. So yeah, um, going on, on now to the, to the next uh, public space project is Alan Alan Chichendo also in Bandung. And um, so yeah, here we sort of continue our quest and, and, and employ what we have learned from the um, previous project, which is a little bit this verticality and sort of the idea of the topography and the spatial diversity, it's sort of not only providing playground features for the kids, but really trying to uh, stimulate people through the geometry and through the landscape to climb up and, and see what's going on. And this is a very, very uh, multifunctional, multi-programmatic park because it not only has uh, um, features of um, sports and, and sitting and hanging out, uh, but it also uh, encompasses uh, public art. And um, we were very much uh, intrigued from our experiences in, in the Netherlands. And one of these very famous and very good examples is the Krilla Müller Museum Sculpture Park in, in Arnhem. And what you see are here are, are two examples. And one is the Jardin de Mer by Jean Dubuffet. And um, it's really a fantastic piece. So we have been there. We have been there with our son. And it is a, a installation from, uh, yeah, as you can read, 1974. And it's a glass fiber epoxy composite. Um, so you can climb up and you, you, you crawl up through a hole and then you're up on this sort of almost alien, strange landscape. You feel like you are in a surrealist painting somehow. So, and this is with the height and with the different texture and with the different color is, is very, very stimulating because it gives you a total different experience. It's also like it lets you experience art by touching it and by living it and by experiencing it. So it, 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 it encompasses or, or yeah, it activates so much more senses. And on the, on the uh, right side, you have the pavilion from Aldo van Eyck, the Sonspec uh, exhibition. And you know, uh, it's also very interesting because how art is framed also through this narrowing down uh, of these corridors and generating these different spaces. So it is also a, a interesting way of, of how to display art and make art engageable uh, for, for the public. And these sort of uh, um, references or experiences were uh, influencing us very much for, for uh, the Alon Alon Chichendo. And here you see in this diagram that it is um, partly yeah, art display. So we had a curator from the IT, uh, ITB, Pa uh, Aswin, and he um, looked for six um, local um, crafts, uh, local artists who did these sculptures, but we have this main square, which is important for uh, national gatherings and prayers. We have a pavilion, we have a uh, basketball, we have a skate park. Uh, we have reallocation of, of street vendors um, busy with, with um, blacksmiths, so we incorporated them. So this is really very, very layered. It's a very rich and very um, yeah, multi-central uh, experience that we, we created here. And um, so we also employ a lot of different textures, um, grass block, then the cortain steel, uh, a little bit rusty because we know uh, we have to build it in Indonesia and it's sometimes a little bit tricky. So how can we employ materials which are a little bit um, more resilient to a certain you know, skill of, of craftsmanship. But all these ideas of these different textures are really employed also to give different sensual experiences for the people, like the pebbles, uh, which the people use as, as a, a ref reflexology garden to walk over. Um, so here what you see is the outside of the park is the pavement, is a space which we call, because you know, for Singaporeans or for developed countries, this is something standard that you have a, a, a sidewalk and for us in Indonesia is not. So all of a sudden, a sidewalk, um, there, there has emergent you know, properties or activities happening because you know, we don't have that much si uh, sidewalks and, and not that wide and not that protected and not that flat. And what I mean with emerging all of a sudden, you know, all these um, bicycle and, and small scooter rental people are popping up and using this space. So this is something really we have to, to think about here in Indonesia, maybe much more than in a sort of uh, regulated environment of, of Singapore, how to even cater for the basics uh, for people. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, we did not plan actually a, a, a playground feature as such, but then people became very, very creative with our benches. So 
um, they start to rearrange these benches as tunnels and so the, the, the furniture becomes a toy. So it's very interesting us, for us also to see how people start to up use or use our designs completely differently. And then we try to learn and, and try to get back uh, to that in, 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 in the next designs. Then we have uh, water features uh, for the kids to bathe. And as you see, we have sort of the program versus the generic space. So the big plaza is used by school kids or snake shows and um, emerging activities. Again, you know, we have actually this dry garden where we thought like the elderly people will sit there. But instead of sitting there and contemplating, it is, you know, a, refle a reflexology garden. People walk over it and the kids use it to, you know, play as almost like in a, in, in a sandbox. Yeah, I mean, this was about the Alon Alon Gicendo, and now we go to away from the landscape projects to our microlibrary projects, and uh, Daliana will explain about that again. Thank you, Florian. So microlibrary projects is the project that we initiate so architects can play too. So not only the users, <laughs> but so that we at the office could also play. Um, and it has a, a mission, a mission of education and reading. And uh, we try to use architecture design to lure people into the building, uh, give some candy such as play spaces, which we're about to show, and hopefully some of them will read. That's, uh, these are five of our built micro libraries here, and we have a lot more in the planning. So uh, we'd like to take you to Bandung again, uh, to the micro library hanging gardens. And uh, this is really important that uh, private sector also take part in the development of play spaces in, 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 in public facilities. Um, because government alone can't do much, to be very honest. And uh, at this, in this occasion, we are um, donated by Manila Water. It's a company, water company from Philippines. Um, and there are a lot of supports from IGER and Indonesian Diaspora Foundation as well. So uh, microlibrary hanging garden is basically a, a vertical stack garden where we're playing with, with different levels um, and as well as the, the space that we have in this public plaza is small and we'd like to multiply space up so that we only take a small footprint yet the experience is maximized. So there is a, a playground, a lookout point, productive garden working together with the local community and then the library is at the bottom of the, of the building. So this is the rooftop farming when we had the um, community gardening together with the youth center and with the people around um, the school. And there is a school nearby. So um, I, we think that learning is also playing. I mean, um, planting, planting uh, herbs and, 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 and fruits, that's also some, something that, that is a play with nature, I think. So um, there is a slide, especially made to give, uh, to give some, something exciting for the kids to come. Uh, and the slide is, is next to, this, uh, uh, to, to the library space, where so we, we hope after taking a ride in the slide, they could come into the library and read some books. And yeah, finally, we go to our um, recently finished microlibrary, Barakayo. Um, in uh, Semarang is also a, a privately funded uh, project by um, the Arkatama Isvara Foundation and it will be donated to the city of Semarang. And so you see this maybe it popped up on your screen a while ago um, and it was a lot of published. So this is a, a, a timber construction and you see we also uh, played here again with a typology of house of stilts. So we have the library space upstairs and we have underneath a sort of a semi outdoor space where people can utilize the seating stairs for watching movie. We have a swing and we have a net. So again, sort of the idea of uh, luring people in or kids in via play features, uh, but then giving them also some spatial components uh, like communication that they can look up into the net and see what's going on in the library. So sort of to bring the people up. So what we try to, to, to achieve is a sort of a well-rounded experience for yeah, everybody. And a um, couple more slides, you see how it is the, when you lie in there and, and you know, the kids are, are starting to talk with each other and say pointing upwards and say come up and or come down and you know, back and forth. So this sort of 
stimulation through activity possibilities is very important in, in our projects. And you see here, yeah, that's the interior, um, yeah, naturally lit, um, nice detailing, uh, very clean and very well uh, executed. Um, so yeah, this is our last project. We're very happy with that. And unfortunately, it's not open yet, uh, thanks to or due to uh, COVID-19, but uh, we hope we will be able to open it soon and then we'll be then really, really, really active. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Shao Architects. That was a fantastic presentation. And uh, we've now come to the end of our talks, but we have a number of questions that have been coming in. And I also have some questions of my own. Um, I think uh, what I noticed from all the presentations is the, the value of tactility in play um, and the use of, of different sensual experiences, um, smell, touch, a, a number of different experiences. And I think there's a big contrast between this form of play and a form of play that just involves the screen. Um, so it's quite interesting to see all that. Uh, I have a few questions for the panelists. The first question I have for Jan um, is actually to do with your inspiration for, the, for your uh, play in museum. And I know that you worked with Lee Wen, but I also wanted to know a bit more about if you were inspired from your own childhood, from your own memories, your own experiences, or did you indeed consult your end users, by whom I mean children? So if you could give us some insight about that, that would be great. Um, okay, so then thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Thank you for, for asking this uh, about my inspiration. Uh, it's two, two different things. Um, about my childhood, uh, if I can just share a bit more personal things, uh, I, I come from Paris suburbs. Um, and so people might think, oh, you come from Paris, a big city, and so on. I come from an HDB, uh, estate and, and coming from Paris suburbs, it is not bright, it is not uh, exciting and uh, back in the 80s, 90s, not so many things were happening and so no access to museum whatsoever. So Paris is 30 kilometers away but you don't have access that much. So, so that's why for me, like growing as an architect and a designer, it was important to design things that are accessible to the people, to everyone, no matter where you're coming from, no matter what is your background, that that you, you can benefit from it, you can enter freely, you can enjoy and you can learn, you can grow. So, so that's for me the, that, that's the biggest inspiration to, to ensure that the experience is amazing for, for everyone to, to perhaps say, oh, I can do the same. I can become an artist, I can become a designer uh, and, and to contribute to that. Um, and the, the other source of inspiration definitely uh, is the, the artist if, he or she is alive, so we can we can work together. Um, but, uh, but of course, the artwork uh, as well, and, and that's well, how we can develop everything by researching deeply into the life of the artist and into the mindset of the artist, and also the aim of the original artwork to be able to develop installation crafted from there. So those are the two inspiration from from like, what I can uh, insert. Fantastic. It was very interesting to hear you talk about how you're not supposed to draw on walls. And I'm not sure if you can see over here, but I did indeed draw on my wall. Um, so I, I do appreciate opening up the space to draw on. That's fantastic. Um, I have a question for Zhu Ping, and I think we know the answer, but perhaps you can talk a little bit more about it. Um, there was a question about whether Funan was entirely inspired by the game you talked about. So I, I think the answer is yes, but, but maybe you can give us a little bit more yeah. insight. Uh, yeah, uh, I think if we had designed Funan entirely around the world of Warcraft, the developers would have killed us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but uh, to your point, I think many of the other panelists will also agree design concepts and the, the ideas behind play can be applied to any project and bring a lot of joy to people. So yes and no, the base concepts behind any play experience will always be part of architecture. Uh, and that's how we design Funan. But we didn't take direct reference from the World of Warcraft, of course. Yeah. Of course. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to see also how you translated 
your experience of, of the game into something much more tactile again and into, into something that includes sensations of cold and warmth. All these are things you can't actually get from, from yes. a game such as the, the one you talked about. Um, I have a third question, a question for Leonard. Um, and the question is, how do you ventilate the snake slide? Uh, there are small, uh, there are small holes uh, actually on top of the uh, uh, tubes, uh, all along the tubes that runs down the slide. Very interesting. So that's, yeah. that's, that's great. One of the things that really struck me about your, um, your proposal or your, your, sorry, not proposal, it's already built, but um, was the, was the striking path that creates the edge condition. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. You spoke about tidal pools. Um, you said a few things about how that informed the way you, you created your composition. But I find it very interesting that edge condition, um, did it come from what was already there? Was it a combination of that and, and other things? Yeah. So uh, actually, one of our uh, objective was to blur the edges, right? Uh, so that uh, you know it, it becomes seamless. The surface becomes seamless most of the time, unless there's a safety issue. So you know uh, there was a question that was related to a safety, and that's really re re uh, with respect to safety, right? Uh, so we try to make as much of the landscape surface as possible accessible and playable. So the whole park is literally a landscape, right? Where there is some issue of safety. Uh, for example, when we had that uh, Rasau boardwalk, right, uh, we made sure it complied with the local safety requirements of all height, right? And even then, you know, there's access, there's a, a stairs that bring you up and uh, down from these uh, uh, four areas. So, uh, we, uh, you know, because uh, these days we try, um, uh, the park has to be barrier-free entry in most places. So our objective is really to make it as accessible and as open as possible. Very interesting. Um, and I have another question. I have a question for Shao. This is actually from me. Um, and I was, I was very interested to see all the different textures that you use in your projects, across your projects. And I think in a way they compose the experience of your projects. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your design process and how early in the process you perhaps begin to look at materials. Is it, is it a case of working like a sculptor where you, where you have the materials speak to you and then come up with a proposal? Or is it a lot of back and forth? Perhaps you could talk about that a little bit more. Um, it depends a little bit on, on, on the project. So for instance, the micro library, the timber one, it was a complete bottom-up process because we had the um, donor, um, the sponsor, um, and they have a wood factory. So we looked explicitly from the standpoint, what can we do with the wood products? Um, the Alun Alun uh, Chichendo with the rusty steel, that came um, also rel relatively early in, in the design process because uh, there are all these blacksmiths uh, located around uh, and all these metal workers, and there's some knowledge about metal. And uh, so we thought about, okay, could we make something in steel to stay true to the theme of the location, as well as sort of get the people who are uh, living there and selling their stuff, maybe participate in also in the production of the park so that they'd be hired as labor from the contractor. Because in Indonesia, you know, uh, uh, training is not that high. So you have a lot of seasonal workers. So, uh, and then very often they just hire people from the street. And since they are know about metal, so we can incorporate them in the design. Mm. Mm. And when we were there, it was actually quite nice that we see people actually from the neighborhood who are very proud and say like, oh, I've worked on that. You know, uh, it's, I, was the, I was part of it. And uh, so, yeah. There are many, many levels of how to imply, uh, employ material into the design, but I would say, yes, it comes relatively early in the design process. It's not uh, some, some, some form of afterthought. It's quite no, that's, quite, that's quite interesting because you know, everyone works in different ways and some people come up with form and then think about material later. And I think it's very important to uh, consider the way that workers in the specific context are going to work. I've also had that experience working in India where I, I knew that they would 
like doing certain things more than others. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I have had a few other questions coming in. Um, one of them is for Jan, and it's the, the, the person's asking if the experience that you presented could be brought to the outside world to increase its visibility and exposure, uh, which is obviously a very nice idea. Yes, yes, that, that, that's uh, it's, it's a very good question uh, to ask whether all of those like dreamscape, playscape from a museum standpoint can be placed outside. Um, actually, it, it, it has been happening quite quite a lot, but more for very short kind of festival, like night festival or uh, the light tonight festival for the National Gallery. So it is usually over like one weekend, two weekends, um, not so much like like this like, children's festival that is like for six months or even some installation are there for almost a year. Uh, so so that's that that's a very good uh, idea to to do that. Uh, but that means of course dealing with spaces outside. Who is the owner? Can we place something there? Um, and and also the um, one of the issues that we face for what that we faced for example is that when you are inside the museum, whatever you design is not a playground. So it doesn't fall under the category of playground. So it, so it doesn't fall under the category of the regulation for the playground. When you're outside, then it's no longer a museum. It's, it's becoming a playground. Uh, the, the Tate uh, in, in the UK did something like this. They did a very large installation that were a kind of a playscape. Uh, and that was a playground slash playscape artscape. So, um, so that's doable, but it has to be more sturdy. And then it will start to become more like what Leonard is, is designing. So something more permanent. So, so it is, uh, <laughs> uh, when, once you go outside the, the, the museum, the risk is like, okay, who can use it? How, what is the safety? Uh, and then like, which regulation shall it comply with? Uh, that you don't have that when you're on the inside of the, of the museum. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, on, on that note, I have another question, which is to do with um, working in an ephemeral way. When you, when you do installations and, and they are ephemeral, they aren't around permanently, do you find that that's an opportunity for you to experiment with ideas that you, you, have, you might end up using later on? Or do you feel also a sense of frustration when you have to take everything down and it, it doesn't remain there? It's, um, it, yeah, it's, it's a very, another very good question because when you design temporarily, uh, the, the first question is sustainability because what we do will be, will be destroyed in, in a certain amount of time. So yes. it is important to, to make sure that these uh, installations are sustainable, recyclable or recycled material. Um, since it is shorter, therefore you can experiment much, much, much faster. And especially when you have daring clients like the National Gallery that are really pushing and exploring new things. Uh, and so what we do there inspire us and my team to design more permanent fixture because we also do architecture and, and so on. So what we learn there, of course, we, we utilize it directly inside more permanent fixture. But yes, there is a frustration that after six months it's, it's gone. Uh, and, uh, and with always the same question of um, like doing good for the planet, that uh, after like demolishing that, destroying that, uh, you don't necessarily feel good. <laughs> so so those, those are a bit of conflicting kind of uh, things that we always want to, de to design something new for the, for the people, um, but at the same time to make sure that it is sustainable. Sustainable, yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, this is a question for Zhu Ping and it is about wayfinding. Uh, so the question is that, did you find that designing in this sort of adventure way, you, you maybe um, had, a had a difficult time balancing wayfinding with the sense of adventure? And did it, did it become an experience where people find it difficult to navigate through the space? Mm, okay, so <laughs> yeah, uh, I, yeah, th that's a very fair question. I think uh, with the retail experience, what is important is that the shops can be found, right? So uh, as the architects, we're always navigating this balance between something that's exciting and something that is easily readable. Yeah. So in the case of uh, Funan, there, there are certain uh, regulations imposed on us by the developer, like a certain offset 
you know, from the void edge for the shops to start. So in following these parameters, making a few adjustments, especially in the BIM space, uh, we were able to make sure that, you know, the shops had their moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, this is augmented by, we had to have a very solid wayfinding strategy. So the, a lot of smart signages have been integrated into the mall, you know, using, again, technology to ensure that people can, can get to the shops that they want. But yes, it's a, it's a, it's a line that we always try to walk. Um, exciting architecture is not necessarily the most tenable architecture. Uh, <laughs> shops need to be regular shaped, you know, uh, no uh, few change in levels and easy to get to, which does not make for the most exciting uh, space. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a fine balance between those two things. And, you know, sometimes a mall is about exploring and, and other times it's about just going to that one place and getting out. Yeah. Um, but I think what I was wondering about also is that, did you observe, if, if you've been back since it's been inhabited, um, have you observed a big difference between how people perhaps play when they're inside uh, and when they're outside in the outside spaces that, that have been made? I, I realized that um, while we thought, oh, some of these views are exciting, the, the number of photo moments that we had to design into the mall actually are very important. Uh, with the advent of social media. Uh, yeah, like uh, uh, some of the photos that have been taken by visitors to the mall are some of the most unexpected views, but quite beautiful that we've seen. Mm. So how people interact with the building is extremely different from how we've designed. Uh, a lot of the rest places are being used a lot, uh, which is a, a good thing for us. But some of these interesting geometries and how they come together have been some of the more attention grabbing parts of the mall that we did not expect to see. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, the next question is actually for everybody. Um, many of the designs mentioned are related to child's play. Do the panelists have views on adult's play, something more serious? Because play is often misunderstood as something unproductive or non-functional. Uh, would you like to start, Leonard? Uh, sure. Um, um... So we do design specific places for kids to play, especially younger ones, where because you know it has to be contained. The parents has to have a, a, a side of them when they play, right? Because they just have to uh, give them guidance. But uh, the entire park is actually, uh, uh, as I said, the canvas for uh, adults in order to enact their, their their adult play, right? And use whatever uh, everyone. So it's it's unprogrammed. Right, we just provide them the backdrop, the props, and everything, and and allow them to exercise the imagination and use it any way they want, right? So it really is up to the adult, individual adults, and how they want to use the space, right? The props are there, you know, all the uh, the topography is there, and you know, and 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 I would say, yeah, it is. It's not directed specifically at kids, right? Uh, it's directed for all user groups, the park, the entire park. Okay, well, I have a couple of other questions also for, for all the panelists. Um, we don't have much time, so I won't, I won't wait for everyone to answer, but um, one of the questions has to do with um, the processes in making a narrative for your spaces. Um, how do you blend the different interactions well? Uh, well, let's, let's try to get that. Uh, I mean, we think that processes has to do with different contexts and for us uh, context inform programs so for, for us programming is very important and everything else actually comes to support that programming and so if uh, a program demands certain materiality or certain forms and certain uh, statements in design then then we do it according to the program um, do you want to add something <laughs> Yeah, I mean, most of the time it starts with a certain imagination, right? So, you know, what could happen there? What could people like? And what would we like? And um, I mean, having been in the Netherlands, there are great play spaces for kids, right? And uh, we have a son and, you know, you roam around. And uh, I think the kid in us is still very strong. So a lot of things are happening just by imagining what we would like and how to interact and then, you know, scale it up and, and sort of design it and make it happen. And architects and designers should not be obedient, but should be rebels. 
So should uh, let the live, uh, uh, let the child inside live in the projects. And when they ask for commercial spaces, suddenly there are certain kind of like RPG kind of set in the middle <laughs> of, of those uh, possible areas. So we, we can we can intervene. We can make the world a more playful space in that manner. Yeah, if, if I can, if you can re react from that, it's um, um, because there's also this question that uh, we're asked about like, the adult and, and so on. Um, when, when we design this festival for kids, um, clearly it is for kids, so therefore it has to be catered for them in terms of height and so on. Um, and they will always find the like, new ways of playing with anything, um, like in a tiny little gap, and they will find like an amazing joy in, in playing with that tiny little gap or hiding themselves and so on. But more, more importantly, it's to engage the adults in that and to, to trigger something new for them. Uh, because they come there, they, they know it's for their kids, so the kids will play. But little by little, they start to you know, break that kind of shell they have around themselves to basically engage with their kids, with other kids, and to interact with the, with the space. Uh, or even when we place things sufficiently high, so you need to carry your kid to do it there. And so, and just by doing that, then it engages the adult, and the adult starts to play. And, that, and that's quite, uh, quite meaningful. And, and the, the narrative in that is very important because, yes, there is an art development, but also what is the meaning of all of that for the people uh, and what they take from them for, for their own life. And perhaps they can reconstruct that in any point, at any point of time in their own life to find their play moment and to really like push for this. Okay, I have one last question. Um, and this is also for all the panelists. So please answer if you, if you would like to. How do you draw the line between playscapes and playgrounds? <laughs> I already responded to this question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for us, we don't. Yeah. We don't. The, the en entire the entire surface is 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 a play area, right? Uh, and 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 I think you'll be too restrictive as a designer, right? To to tell people that you know you you can only do a, a playground here and this is basket. You know, I actually uh, personally, I I don't even see a differentiation in the meanings, right? A playground is also a playscape. It's really 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 up to you how you interpret it. Right, and the playscape can be a playground, right? Uh, but may maybe without the off on the shelf element, right? But uh, really, how do you want to engage it would determine uh, how ultimately you define the space. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really good point. Human beings will always have a tendency to augment the world around them. We see this as kids, right? Like a table and chair become a mountain and a castle. Your parents become your mighty steed or like a you know a giant bear to fight. So. Uh, to, I think we will all agree that the playscape and, playscape and playground are kind of one and the same. Uh, as architects, we build the environment, but it is for people to imagine and add their own layers of meaning to it. And that's when architecture comes alive and gains meaning, you know, both in the retail space or in a park or in a school or in a museum. Yeah. Um, any, any other comments on I that mean, question? If, if a playground is sort of more defined as a sort of a functional separated zone of a set of uh, play furniture. And then of course we advocate the, the playscape, right? Where it sort of um, transforms from one into the other, not necessarily had a sort of a, a bordered um, or a clearly defined zone. Because <clears throat> I think is what is very interesting in a lot of these examples we have seen here, is it's not just tied down to a piece of furniture where you can have a swing or whatever, but that the structure of the space, the landscaping, the installation, the three-dimensional elements already sort of start to um, trigger kids to play, not only on this piece of furniture. And I think this is sort of this, the sense of the playscape itself, right? So that is not only what you place there, so, but how you structure the whole um, landscape and environment and so on and so forth, and the texture and how you trigger people and kids. Yeah, I think playscapes and playgrounds are in the eyes of beholder. So if you, uh, <laughs> good answer. If you'd like as a user to play, then go play wherever you are. Yeah, I would agree with that. Well, one final question to wrap up. 
Um, and this one is, it, it was addressed to Jan, but I'm going to ask all the panelists again. Um, it has to do with the, uh, the way interactions turned out. Were there any interactions that you saw that, that weren't exactly the way you intended and perhaps were either a surprise in a good way or a disappointment? Perhaps um, we start with Juping. We, I think, uh, well, let me think. Um, I, I think what, what was surprising to come out of it is the number of wedding photos that have been taken <laughs> at the garden staircase. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of heights. Uh, the, the, structure, the structure is very safe. But like the number of um, wedding couples that have had their photos taken there <laughs> has been extremely surprising. And uh, well, it's, it's very, I'm very happy to see it. But yeah, it, it's been quite, quite a joy to watch. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Any other takers? The, the, the thing is, like, when you design for kids, they, of course, always do exactly what they're not supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> so no matter what you do, they will always find the, the wrong way of utilizing something <laughs> and to make fun with it. So, so actually, that's, that's the base of, of Playscape. Like, you envision something because also like I'm, I'm very to I'm two meter tall, so of course my the vision of the reality is a bit different when you are only like 75 centimeters. So so of course I didn't perceive the same thing, and the kids would just like do something radically different and to and again to take great joy in doing that. So no matter what you design for or what you are trying to, to cater for, it, it will be totally in, in in another direction for them to play with. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, that, that was wonderful to get all your insights. And I, I'm, we weren't able to answer all the questions, but we tried to address as many as possible. And thank you so much for, for tuning in. Um, and we just have a few uh, things to wrap up with. So if you... Uh, we would like to thank you for joining us this evening. Should you wish to revisit today's discussion, the recording of the session will be made available and shared with you via email. Also, we would love to know what you thought of this webinar. At the end of this Zoom, Zoom session, you'll be directed to a link. Please click on the link and complete the short survey. And if, if you look on the screen, you can see the, the QR codes are up there for the survey. And if you, if you wish to find out more about programs that the National Design Center has lined up for the month of July under the theme of PowerPlay, just scan the QR code you see on the screen under PowerPlay. Finally, I would like to thank the speakers for collaborating with us to make this webinar possible. We hope you found the session meaningful and enjoyable. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye. 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 B